Okay, we are moving on in field forces today. We are still talking about the gravitational force, though. So, um, specific to the gravitational force, we're going to be talking about orbits. The reason we're talking about orbits is because this is one of the big things we see happening with gravitational force. The moon goes around us, we send satellites up there in orbit, everything's in orbit. So, uh, specifically talking about orbits, one of the things before we got to Newton's gravitation uh, was Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. They're all observational laws. He didn't have a why. Newton provided a little bit of a why. The first one is that all planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one of the focuses, at one focus. So, an ellipse is a cool little shape. It's kind of an oval, but it has some mathematic specificity to it. So, the sun is going to be at one of those focal points. And before we move on, it's good to note that most of the elliptical orbits in the solar system are very nearly circular. They're only slightly elliptical. Now, for an ellipse, it's a conical shape. A conic section is one of the things that we call it. So you make this by cutting or passing a plane through a cone, conic. And so if you take that cone and you cut it, you get a conic section. The ellipse, that angle is somewhere between the base and that side. Any angle along there is going to give you an ellipse. Uh, the other thing mathematically interesting about an ellipse is that a line uh, going from one focus to the outside edge or the side back to the other focus is going to be the same no matter what point you go to. So all those little blue lines starting from one focus, going to the outside, coming back to the other focus, have the same length. That's one of the mathematically fun things about an ellipse. Now, that's what an ellipse is. So, number two... A line drawn from the sun to a planet is going to sweep out equal areas in equal time. Now, you, you're going to need to see a picture for that. It's a little bit weird. So, a line from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Sorry about that. I don't know what quite happened. There we go. So, here's our ellipse. There's the sun at one focus. There's one time period. We'll call it a month because we're just talking about the earth going around the sun. And that's the area swept out by that line connecting the planet and the sun. Here's another month, uh, a couple months, six months later, and we have a whole different area for that same time interval at a different section. Now, what this second law says is that... Um, the area for one month over here and the area for one month over there, those two areas are the same. Now, that doesn't mean anything all by itself, but the implications are, are, are pretty uh, interesting. So one of them is that planets move faster when they are closer to the sun. And they move slower when they are farther away from the sun. And then the second thing uh, that comes from this, 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 the planets move this way because of the conservation of angular momentum. That's what our whole next slide is going to be about, is these elliptical orbits and how they work. But... They move this way fast, close, and slow further away because of angular momentum. And then there's a third Kepler's law. We're not going to do much with it. Uh, but the ratio of the orbital period squared to the orbital radius 
is the same and is constant, that ratio of t squared per r cubed, for every single planet. We're not going to have to do any calculations with that. It's just a really good to know law. So let's, let's move on and talk about these elliptical orbits. So just to kind of reiterate, so here's our ellipse, there's the sun. We're going to say that's our planet. That's when it's close to the sun. We call that perihelion. And the other end, when we're the farthest away, is aphelion. Perihelion, closest, aphelion, farthest. So the perihelion is the closest approach. Aphelion is the farthest, furthest, farthest, farthest approach. Maybe it's furthest. So an object in orbit, this one's going to be a planet, and we're just going to kind of say what we said again around the sun, is moving most quickly at its closest approach and slowest at its farthest approach. So if we look at the force on a planet traveling around this orbit, there's the radius from, um, there's the radius from the planet to the sun. That force points along that radius. And that's going to be true at any point we go to, since the thing that the force is pointing to is our gravitational center. At any point in orbit, gravity acts along the radius, which means gravity is not a torque, and angular momentum is conserved. That's great. We can use this result. So as this planet or an object orbits, Angular momentum stays constant, or is conserved. So let, let's just find some interesting things out. So if we just look at perihelion, let's say we have a velocity up like that, and we're a radius of r perihelion, so we use a p away, and we look at the same point on the other side, aphelion, which has its velocity at aphelion and its radius at aphelion. We can say that the angular momentum at perihelion is equal to the angular momentum at aphelion. Again, it's going to have the same angular momentum at any point that we go to, which is really cool. So we can say MVA at one point is equal to MVA at another point. And the reason we're using MVA is because we just have a particle moving. It's not spinning about its own axis. It's spinning about something. It's revolving around something else. It's not, it's not rotating on its own axis. So we're going to use the MVA. And in this case, A is just the distance from the line of velocity to the center. It's RP and RA, respectively. The M's cross out. And what we see is that um, the velocity times the distance we are from the sun at one point is equal to the velocity times the distance we are from the sun at another point. And it's always going to be the same. So if the velocity goes down, that's because the radius went up. So the further away we go, the slower we move. And the closer we get, the faster we move. So we'll use this result a little bit to find out uh, speeds at different parts in orbits. Uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is circular orbits. Now, just as a note, a circle is a special kind of ellipse. It's kind of the perfect kind of ellipse where the two foci are at one point. There's no, there's no gap between them. That's a perfect circle. And, and the reason we do this is because it gives us a convenient way to calculate things. When we go in a circle, we, we use centripetal force, centripetal acceleration, which is very, very, very helpful when calculating orbital speeds and orbital radiuses. So here's my circle, here's my sun, here's my planet. That's my velocity, and that's my radius. So before we get into any calculations, let's just talk about what's going on a little bit. So in a circle, the radius never changes. Uh, so the velocity has to remain the same size. It has the same value. Its direction changes, so it's not technically constant, but it has the same value. 
And the reason is because of conservation of angular momentum. That A never changes. Gravity is not a torque. So that V cannot change either. Which is nice. So we have constant velocity. Another reason that we can say that is because gravity is acting like a centripetal force. It's pulling in towards the center. And that force is always at 90 degrees. It's always perpendicular to the velocity. That means it's not going to change the size of the velocity, just the direction. That's a huge thing to remember when we're in orbit. The speed in orbit doesn't change because that force is perpendicular to the velocity at all points. So that velocity never changes size. So, looking at what happens in circular orbits, let's take our planet and, and look at the net force acting on it. We know net force is ma, but in this case, our force is going to be the force of gravity. And because we're going in a circle, we have centripetal acceleration. Now, we know the force of gravity is gmm over r squared, and we know that centripetal acceleration is mv squared over r. So some r's cross out and some m's cross out. In fact, the mass of the satellite goes away. The object's mass cancels out. But the big mass, the mass of uh, the sun, if we're going around the sun, or the mass of a planet, if we're talking about a moon going around a planet, never ever goes away. So what we see here, and those hours go away, what we see here is that the velocity in orbit depends on the mass of the thing that we're going around and how far away we are from it. That's all. Which means that anything in orbit with the Earth around the Sun, we're all moving at the same speed, regardless of our mass. Uh, now, another thing to, to look at is that we don't always talk about velocity. Sometimes we talk about velocity in terms of period. So sometimes we also look at velocity in terms of orbital period. What that does for us, uh, it just gives us another way to talk about things. Now again, things have to be in seconds, but for us, the orbital period is a year. It's, it's a good thing to know. So velocity in terms of orbital period, just talk about orbital period. That is the time it takes for one complete orbit. So... To talk about the velocity in terms of orbit, we need the distance we travel and the time it takes us to travel that. Well, the distance we travel is 2 pi r. That's the orbital distance. That's the circumference of that circle that you see. And the time is just the period. So the velocity is 2 pi r over the period. 2 pi r is the orbital circumference, the distance that we travel. And t is the period. So we can substitute that in for velocity. So gm over r equals 2 pi r over t, whole quantity squared. So when we do that, it's gm over r equals 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. And mathematically, those r's don't cancel out. In fact, they go together. So by combining those, we get this nice little result. gm equals 4 pi r cubed over t squared. And we could solve for kind of whatever thing we needed right there, but... This gets you started in talking about uh, the period when we talk about orbital velocity and orbital radius. So we're going to have a lot of practice with this tomorrow, um, but that's all we have for orbits right now.